first, I want to ask you guys kind of what you make of what happened um, in Egypt. And what, what is the lesson? Like, was it an anomaly? Was it just like, you know, whale happened to get arrested and then they, <laughs> things, things happened? Or, 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 or what is the change, the, the, the broader change um, that, that kind of brought this on? Uh, Maya, I'll start with you. Sure. So I think we've all seen that this is, I mean, I, I would agree that this is not an anomaly. Um, and the power of, uh, you know, social media as being a voice that aggregates uh, how people feel about a certain situation, a political situation, has definitely elevated uh, the, not the right so much, but just the, you know, vocal range of, of somebody who, um, you know, doesn't feel right with their political situation. What we've seen in the ABC News is that we actually um, were able to uh, use that as a tool in our own uh, sourcing of news, um, and and you know the more we actually uh, the more that the more that it is used, the more that tools like Twitter are used, the more that that social access tools are used, um, the more that pads out our own coverage. So we look at it as a way of looking at a story from a 360 angle, whereas you know before um, we had to actually go after trying to find. Uh, you know, sources for stories. We're now finding that a lot of that is, uh, if, if you're looking in the right place, you can definitely get a lot of that coverage. Joe, what do you what do you think? I mean, is do you believe? You know, Wells' book is called Revolution 2.0. Kind of the pre premise is that, yeah, that, that social media sort of changed the way politics works. And obviously, you're trying to do that kind of in your own way. And I, I'm curious. Do you buy that premise, or, or to what extent is that is that true? So I, I think that the fundamentals of political organizing have remained unchanged for like the history of the time. Moses was an organizer, Jesus was an organizer, Allah was an organizer, um, and what's changed is the technology. And I think you know, I think you know, to, to be a little U.S. centric for a second, if you look at the history of American politics, it's been very driven by communication technology. So the first American presidential election. Uh, in 1789, uh, there were 38,000 people that voted out of a population of 3 million. So slightly more than 1% of the population voted. So the communication technology was leaflets and town hall meetings, and literally everybody could talk to each other. And then you entered the era of broadcast, where many historians would argue that Franklin Delano Roosevelt never could have done the New Deal without radio, because he had the opportunity to directly communicate. So what we see is that the fundamentals of organizing, which is about working through people's relationships, and building movements are unchanged. What technology does is it provides new ways to communicate, and it allows also allows the older ways to be more efficient, right? You, you can get people together much more quickly for a rally, right? People marching in a square is a very, very old tactic. Assembling them with social media is much, much more efficient. So my core takeaway from my involvement in Facebook and causes a nation builder is that it's all about these core social dynamics and they're lubricated and made more efficient by technology, but they're fundamentally, I think, the same. Yeah. So, how important, well, was it that you could start this? So he started a Facebook group, the way the whole revolution, not, sorry, not the whole yes. revolution, <laughs> but his story begins um, starting a Facebook group for a, a young man who was beaten brutally and, and killed by uh, secret police. And you did that anonymously. And at some point, you sort of stepped forward and, and, and stopped being anonymous. And I, I kind of want to, you know, there, there's all this discussion right going around right now about, you know, how important is anonymity on the internet. And I wanted to ask you sort of, yeah, like, how important was it that you could start that Facebook group anonymously? And, and then also, like, at what point do you have to stop being anonymous? Or how far does anonymity really need to go? So just, just as a clarification, I don't agree with those who say that this is a Facebook revolution. I, I think that this is a people's revolution and uh, it, it did start because of so many reasons, not just the call uh, or a call that happens to be on in the internet that people uh, uh, listen to or believed in. Um, I, was, I was known as, uh, as, as, the, as the owner or the founder of the page uh, after I was arrested uh, because at, before that, I made sure that no one knows. Um, the anonymity had a lot of uh, value to in, in our experience. Uh, one is that, uh, of course, it, it provides you with, uh, with flexibility and you feel like you're safe 
uh, state security is not going to come after you until you, you know, you are arrested or this is what you are going to do and this is not what you are going to do. The second, which is the most important, is that anonymity provides people, a lot of people with belief that the guys behind this are not taking any credit. And this is a big part of a lot of our, uh, um, I, I believe in that quote that say a lot of this world could, uh, could happen and be achieved uh, if no one fights for credit. So uh, uh, that was a very interesting uh, thing that happened in, in, our, uh, in our case. Um, I, I don't know if it's, anonymity has its good and bad, just like how we use technology in politics has its own good and, uh, uh, and bad. But in our experience, in, in, in my experience, it was, it was very essential. So, do you, Joe, like when, with your company, have you had to deal with these issues? I mean, are there time, I mean, I don't know, have you had to deal with law enforcement or governments or, or whatever trying to, I, I don't know, intervene and expose users, or have you given that much thought, or is that, does that come into play yet? Uh, it's sort of something we think about. Um, we actually have had a few circumstances, but we can't talk about them. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, just broadly speaking, what's the general... Well, I think that, you know, what, what, what gets interesting, right, is when democracy and legality come into conflict, um, where, you know, our company is founded on the idea of, you know, small-d democracy, that we can, our software can empower thousands and thousands of political leaders to get elected, not because they have more money, but because they do a better job of organizing people. Well, there are times when that is illegal. Um, and for us, you know, this core value of us is democracy, and ultimately that's kind of where we stand. Um, one of the things to, to change, sorry, to change tax slightly that's been very interesting to me, and we were talking about a little bit before, is the post-revolution. And, you know, I think, especially in the developed world, we often think of politicians and political consultants and political operatives as kind of slimy and unnecessary evil of democracy. But it's, you know, in a country that's never had democracy, you know, you, you've seen the Islamicists be really well organized. I mean, you, once you have democracy, you then have to run campaigns. And so having the tools and having the expertise to actually organize people becomes absolutely critical. You, you're going from theoretical to reality. Hmm. So, right now in the U.S., Maya, I want to bring you in. You know, we have a presidential election. Uh, and kind of the, there are sort of two things that a lot of people are talking about. You know. One, I would say to a lesser extent, is social media. The other is money. And basically, unprecedented amounts of money being used to buy television ads. Um, at times, extremely nasty, slimy television ads. And I'm kind of curious, Maya, I'll start with you, but all of you, is that the future? Or is that just kind of a weird blip that's happening? And that, you know, eventually, like, you know, we're just going to all be. Uh, like, you know, that these social media technologies will sort of catch up and this money and politics thing will just be some weird thing that happened in 2012. Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, I think mudslinging has, is, is an age-old political pastime. I actually just read a book um, that was written by Cicero about how to win an election. Uh, and uh, mudslinging was probably one of, the, one of the things that was brought up the most. Um, so I don't, I don't think that, I mean, I'm, I'm always hopeful to think that that, that that wouldn't always be the case, but in terms of um, the, you know, as, as Joe is saying, the communication tools um, will continue to evolve. So the more, infor the, the more access to information that users have, um, the, the less, the, per perhaps less likely that an attack ad, or, or it'll be a little bit more uh, contextualized with everything else that they can learn and so, um, about a particular candidate. So, well, I don't think that that's going to go away. I think empowering um, voters to learn as much about, about the political system and political candidates is, is really going to empower them. I think, you know, one important thing is to realize that the American presidential election is a huge anomaly. In that, so I've had the really interesting experience of being in Canada and Australia and Ireland and the UK and seeing their political systems. The American political system is the only one with relatively unregulated campaign finance. Right here in Ireland and the UK, you can't buy TV ads, you can't buy radio ads. You know, the entire British political system, the UK, will spend about $20 million on a general election. This American general election will be about $3 billion, right? So it's an enormous difference. And so, so in most places, they're spending their effort on knocking on doors. Like, 
The, the British, they can't even afford to send out mail through the post. They actually have volunteers drop it off. And so what we see with Nation Builder is that we're empowering those grassroots campaigns to be able to win because of better elbow greets, better volunteer organizing. And so I think when the, 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 when the story, when the book is written about the internet and politics, it's going to be about these local grassroots campaigns. I look at the American presidential election because it's, it's so big media, it's so big money. You know, it is as old media as it gets. Yeah, yeah. So there are a lot of startup uh, people in the audience. And, and well, you brought up this, this awesome example of this two-person startup. They didn't know, they didn't think that they were helping to, you know, bring, try to bring democracy to Egypt. And, and they kind of were in a weird way. And I, I wanted to ask you guys, first of all, like, what, what should the people in the audience be thinking about this? Should they be, is this a market opportunity? <laughs> is it? Well, I think the best thing that's happened in technology is empowering individuals. And uh, I believe that this is, this is the fact that the, on the long term, this will have a huge implications on, on politics because um, in the past, uh, the, the, the depth of social hierarchy was high between the political leaders and the public. Yet now the public can easily organize themselves, can decide on, uh, you know, reach out a conclusion and take an action uh, without having to do this over uh, um, a couple of months because there are 10,000 people that need to agree on this. This can easily happen in a survey in about a couple of days uh, and, and finalize. So this opens uh, a lot of ground for um, innovation. I believe also that technologists should not get in uh, uh, in the process, should not have a say in what should happen and what should not. They should just provide them the means and the tools for the people and let the people manage it on, on their way. Um, uh, I have a very interesting example that is post-revolution uh, on the impact of, what, of how people can organize themselves. In, in uh, one of the Egyptian governorates, people were suffering from the trash problem, trash collection. So um, a lot of the young Facebook guys decided on creating an event where everyone is going to collect their trash and go to the governor office and throw the trash <laughs> right in front of his office. And that was... Um, How big was the trash? <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was relatively a good size. Uh, you know, you can easily see. And then they take the photo and, and put it online. So people actually are, are taking sort of activism. I, I believe that in, in the next few years, the, the concept of you know leadership by charisma is is going to go on the decline, and the concept of leadership by empowering people, empowering others, and the the role of activists uh, versus the role of politicians is gonna it's it's not going to be more, but it's going to you know the the gap is going to be more more north, and this is what we we are here should should be doing if we are if we believe in change and empowering individuals and making sure that um, everyone has a say and uh, and something to offer the world, then we should be working in tools to empower them. I, I, I just think that's absolutely right. I mean, the fundamental ideal of the internet is the idea that it's permissionless, right? There's no central authority of the internet. The internet is by definition decentralized. You don't have to ask anyone's permission to set up a website. And I think that, you know, government in many ways is all about asking for permission. You've got to ask permission of 50% plus one of people to get elected, and then you're in the legislature and you have to ask permission to get a bill through. And we're all, we all act surprised when nothing gets done. And I think that what, what's possible is to let, just as Wael was saying, to let people self-organize so they don't have to wait that for permission. They don't have to wait for the government to clean up their trash. They can not only demonstrate that Salko can clean it up themselves. So I, I, I just wanted to jump in on the question of opportunity. Um, I think there's, especially for a news organization, um, there's plenty of opportunity if you're a startup looking to uh, help out in sourcing of news. Right now what we're seeing is, you know, all this, um, it, it's great that there's a ton of more content coming in. Um, but helping managing that uh, or create, we, we work constantly and we're constantly experimenting, we're constantly working with third parties and lots of startups um, to, you know, ensure that we're being accurate, that we're, um, that we're being scalable and that we're being efficient about delivering the news. So if you're a startup in that space, now is, is a great time for, for, uh, for opportunity in that sphere. So I want to I ask you guys, when this, when this survey startup, or, or, or maybe it's Google, or maybe it's Facebook, gets a call from the government saying, hey, can you take down that video, can you, can you take down the survey, whatever. I think we're all sort of in agreement that they should probably say no. Um, but 
Uh, how? Or should they say anything? I mean, what, what happens if the activists call and say, hey, would you mind promoting this uh, YouTube video? Like, how involved should a startup get or a media company get um, or a big tech company get in all this stuff that's happening? I mean, as, as a revolution is playing out, it's, it's not always clear, like, who's right and who's wrong. What? Yeah, there are obviously different schools in, in, in this, and um, I, I just like what Joe was saying, I remember this quote, I can't remember who said it, that uh, the best thing about the internet is that everyone is controlled because nobody is in control. So um, uh, I believe that I'm, I come from this school, yet I do understand, you, you cannot just, at the end of the day, the pace of technology is going much faster than how we develop as individuals. And, and, and that, re, you know, re represent a lot of challenges in this world. Should you just uh, uh, allow everyone to be anonymous? Uh, on one hand, it protects their identity and let them say whatever they want. On the other hand, it could be pretty dangerous because people are going to be much more aggressive and then the, the level of aggression would drive the community or the country or, you know, the whole world in, in a negative direction. So there is there's no absolute right or wrong, and I think this kind of arguments are already existing in, in, in at the top level of many big companies. What should what is the level of influence? What should we get in, and what should, what we should not? Yeah. Anything to, uh, to add there? We have a couple of seconds. Uh, no, I actually agree with that. <laughs> okay. Well, that okay. So we're out of time. So I uh, just want to thank you guys for for being here. Thank you for. Uh, listening, giving us an audience. Um, it's really a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.